Good morrow one and all, I'm Mr King and today I'll be sharing with you my analysis and commentary on Joe Shapcott's poem, Phrasebook. This video is designed to help students who might want to study Phrasebook in preparation for their English Literature GCSE. Now the first thing I will acknowledge is this is one of the more challenging poems in the anthology. So what we will do is we will think about the context that this poem was written in, we'll think about some of its key ideas, and then I will share with you some of my ideas that might be a useful starting point when analysing this poem yourself. So what on earth is going on in this poem? Well, this poem was written uh, in 1991 in response to the First Gulf War. This is the same conflict which inspired the poem Lament to be written, which is also in the Towards a World Unknown anthology. And in the most simple terms possible, the First Gulf War was a war between the United States, the United Kingdom and a coalition of other countries against Iraq uh, in response to their invasion of Kuwait. Now this was a widely televised conflict and people back at home in the UK and in the US were able to see images of this battle through their television screens. And Jo Shapcott wrote this poem in response to some of the things that she herself saw on television about the first Gulf War. Now, before I go any further in talking about this poem, I'd like to share this with you. This is Jo Shapcott talking about this poem. She says, the poem raises a question about individual human love. Is it possible in a world where war is taking place, however far away? And I think this is a really useful starting point when looking at this poem. Joe Shapcott tells us that this poem is a response to the chaos and the violence of the First Gulf War. And she's exploring what it's like to be a person who sees these images and wonders how is that going to affect us as people. Now, Joe Shapcott is a modern poet who is still writing today, and she is very well aware of the fact that there are a number of students trying to get their heads around her poem in preparation for this exam. So very helpfully, she has written a very short blog unpicking this poem herself, and I would strongly recommend that you pause this video here. I'll put the link in the description below to her blog and that you go to her blog and quickly read what she herself has to say about this poem because I do think it's an excellent starting point. So I'll give you a moment to pause the video here, click on the link in the description below, and then once you've read what Joe Shapcott has to say, come back to this video and I will talk you through some of the key ideas in a bit more detail. So let's have a look at this poem together. And the first thing to say before we even look at it is this poem does not have one single story that goes from the beginning to the end. This is not like the destruction of Sennacherib, which tells a very clear historical story. This poem is more like a painting made out of words. There's no one clear idea. There's lots of different ideas spattered around, mixed up with one another. And it's our job as students of this poem to work out what some of the key ideas really are. So if you read this poem and are struggling to find one single storyline, or if you're struggling to understand exactly what's going on, don't worry, that's kind of the point. You're not meant to understand one clear narrative moving through the whole poem. Instead, we're meant to understand that there are lots of different ideas and we'll try to understand those together in a moment. But first, let's have a look at it. Phrasebook. I'm standing here inside my skin, which will do for a human remains pouch for the moment. Look down there, up here, quickly, slowly. This is my front room where I'm lost in the action, live from a war on screen. I am an Englishwoman. I don't understand you. What's the matter? You are right. You are wrong. Things are going well, badly. Am I disturbing you? TV is showing bliss as taught to pilots. Blend, low silhouette, irregular shape, small, secluded. Please write it down. Please speak slowly. 
Bliss is how it was in this very room, when I raised my body to his mouth, when he even balanced me in the air, or at least I thought so. And yes, the pilots say yes, they have caught it through the side-looking airborne radar, and through the J-stars. I am expecting a gentleman, a young gentleman, two gentlemen, some gentlemen. Please send him, them, up at once. This is really beautiful. Yes, they have seen us, the pilots from the kill box, on their screens and played a routine for getting a stealth that is cleaned to you and me, taken out. They know how to move into a single room like that, to send in with pinpoint accuracy a hundred harms. I have two cases and a cardboard box. There is another bag there. I cannot open my case. Look out, the lock is broken. Have I done enough? Bliss, the pilots say, is for evasion and escape. What's love in all this debris? Just one person pounding another into dust, into dust. I do not know the word for it yet. Where is the British consulate? Please explain. What does it mean? What must I do? Where can I find? What have I done? I have done nothing. Let me pass, please. I am an Englishwoman. So, undoubtedly, this is a challenging poem, but as I said earlier, this poem does not have a single storyline that goes through from start to finish. It also doesn't have one single interpretation. There are many different things you could say about this poem. Instead, I like to think of this poem as a picture made out of words with lots of different ideas and different voices blurring together. And it's going to be our job to unpick and interpret those voices together. Now, one of my colleagues, Mr. Foster, suggested that a really useful starting point for this poem is to recognise that there are different voices that we can find and unpick in this poem. Let me explain what he means. So there are three distinct voices, and the first voice is the voice of the narrator. What do we know about the narrator? Well, we meet her in line one. I'm standing here inside my skin. We know that she's an English woman. We see that in line six. And it's clear that she is someone who is watching the television, a bit like Joe Shapcott herself, seeing these images of the first Gulf War. And as she sees these images of war on TV, she's going to be thinking about how that affects her. What else do we know about this narrator? We know that she has at least one, possibly multiple romantic relationships. She talks about uh, raising her body to his mouth in line 13, which is clearly a description of some kind of sexual encounter. We also see in lines uh, 18 and 19, that she was expecting a gentleman, a young gentleman, two gentlemen, some gentlemen. This narrator is someone who has seen these images of war and she is reflecting in this poem on how that affects her, her identity and her view of love. Another distinct voice we see in this poem are phrases from a 1960s tourist phrase book. Jo Shapcott explained in her blog that many of the phrases in this poem, for example, please write it down, please speak slowly, which we can see in line 11, are phrases which come from a tourist phrase book, which someone who doesn't speak English particularly well might use to help them use the English language more effectively. The third voice that we see in this poem is militaristic language, words associated with the military. And I'm sure you noticed some of that language filtering into the poem. Now, if you are unfamiliar with any of the military language, uh, Jo Shapcott has given a really helpful glossary in her blog. So I would redirect you back to that blog again. But for example, in the extract on the screen in front of us, we see a reference in line two to a human remains pouch, which is more informally known as a body bag a bag that you might use to uh, wrap a, uh, a killed soldier in, to put their body into. We also see uh, the word bliss mentioned in line 9, and in line 10 and 11, we see that bliss is actually a military acronym. It's a word which stands for blend, low silhouette, 
irregular shape, small and secluded. I'm going to come back to that particular example later, so I'll say no more about it for now. But the key thing to say is that in this poem, we can see at least three distinct voices. Sometimes it's really obvious which voice is speaking. At other times, it's much more ambiguous. It's not clear if it's the phrase book or if it's the narrator. It's not clear if it's the military language or the narrator or any other combination. So here on the screen, for example, I've just highlighted some of the different voices where I think it's clear who is talking, but there are other sections I haven't highlighted. And in those sections which I haven't highlighted, I would argue it's not as clear which voice is speaking. Is it the narrator? Is it the phrase book? Is it the military language? I'm not sure. And I think the ambiguity is done on purpose. Now, at this point, I'm going to move into my analysis and commentary of this poem. Now, if you've seen any of my other videos about the poems in the OCR Poetry Anthology, you will know that my usual approach is to read through the poem stanza by stanza and to unpick some of the key language and structural features that you might want to comment on in your exam. Unfortunately, I don't think that approach makes sense with this poem. As this poem doesn't have one key idea which flows through the entire poem in a nice chronological sense, I think it's going to be really difficult to analyse the poem in a chronological way. So instead, what I'd like to do is I would like to look at three key ideas or three key questions. And as I approach each of these three questions, I will talk about language and structural techniques that you could write about in your exam. So here are the three key, here are the three key questions which I would look at when analysing this poem. First of all, how is war presented? And in particular, what are the limits of war? How does war affect love? And how does war affect people's identity? I think that by thinking about these three questions, it gives us a much more solid starting point to analyse this poem. So, where should we start in analysing Phrasebook? Well, given that you've analysed a number of poems where you've explored what war is like, that feels like a sensible starting point for this poem. In Phrasebook, is war presented as glorious? like it is in the beginning of the destruction of Sennacherib? Or is war presented as horrific as it is in the poem Anthem for Tomb Juve? Well, I would argue that in this poem, war is presented as pervasive. If you're unfamiliar with the word pervasive, it means it spreads everywhere in a really unpleasant way, like if you pour too much squash into a glass of water the squash spreads everywhere and makes the drink taste unpleasant. In the same way, I would argue that in this poem, Shapcott shows that the effects of war spread everywhere in an unpleasant way. We know that Joe Shapcott wrote this poem after seeing images of the first Gulf War. And even though she was separated geographically from the war zone, she feels like she is part of the war zone and she is affected by the conflict, despite the geographical distance. War's effects have left the battlefield and have left a profound impact on the narrator of Frey's book. Therefore, war is pervasive. Let me see if I can prove that point by looking at a few quotes. TV means that you can watch wars unfold, and if that's true, well, where are the boundaries of the battlefield? It's difficult to tell sometimes. Let me show you what I mean. At the end of the first stanza and at the start of the second stanza, Shapcott writes, this is my front room where I'm lost in the action, live from a war on screen. On a simple level, this quote could suggest that the narrator is in her lounge, watching TV. She's engrossed by what she sees on TV, hence the phrase lost in the action. And she's watching live TV, she's watching live images of this conflict, hence the phrase, live from a war. However, on a deeper level, you could argue that this quote shows that war is pervasive and that it's having a profoundly negative impact on the narrator. 
because she's not just watching TV. She's not just watching the conflict. She feels like she's part of it and it's really negative for her. The phrase, I'm lost in the action, could imply that the narrator feels like she's in the conflict, like she's lost in it. And so the word lost here could imply that she feels overwhelmed and she feels distraught, as one might feel if they really were lost in a battlefield. Furthermore, the line break between this is my front room and the phrase lost in the action could imply that she feels that she's left her front room. She feels like she is present in the war because of the images she sees on TV. Furthermore, the phrase live from a war could imply that the narrator feels like she is living the experience of war, hence the word live, live from a war on screen. And the enjambment separates the phrase on screen from the rest of a sentence. It's almost like the narrator needs a beat to remember that actually this war really is on screen because for a moment she feels like she is live in a war. And then she remembers it is just on screen. But all of this suggests that the war is having a profoundly negative experience on the narrator, even though she's only watching it through TV. So that suggests that war is pervasive. Furthermore, we can see that war is pervasive in this poem through the simple fact that there's a semantic field of militaristic language which itself pervades this poem. The fact that the narrator of this poem uses lots of military terms to explain her experience of the world implies that she is constantly thinking about the images of conflict and violence that she's seeing on her TV. That implies that the images of conflict and the war is having an incredibly negative impact on the narrator. Let me give you an example of what I mean. At the beginning of the poem, the narrator says that she is standing here inside her skin, which will do for a human remains pouch. A human remains pouch is a term which describes a body bag. It's what you would put a dead body into. Here, she describes her skin as a body bag, which implies that she feels dead inside. Is that because all of the negative images she's seen on the news is making her feel dead inside? Has the conflict had such a negative experience on her that she feels barely alive? The militaristic language which pervades this poem implies the narrator cannot help but understand her own experience through military terms. The semantic field of militaristic language shows that the only way she can make sense of the world around her is by using military terms. So this shows that the war is having a profoundly negative impact on our narrator's view of the world. At this moment in time, it might be worth pausing to consider what other words we could use to describe how war is presented in this poem. Is war overwhelming? Is it confusing? Is it destructive? Is it corrupting? Perhaps it'd be worth pausing here and exploring how you could argue these points in for the presentation of war in this poem. A second thing or a second question, which I think is really worth considering in this poem, is how does war affect love? I'd like to go back to that quote we began this video with from Jo Shapcott. She says, the poem raises a question about individual human love. Is it possible in a world where war is taking place, however far away? It's a good question. Does love make sense when people are doing really violent things to each other around the world? I hope so, but it's a question worth considering. Now, in this poem, we see that the media diet of warfare has really affected the narrator of this poem. Whenever the narrator thinks about love, she can't help but think about it in militaristic language. Have a look here. TV is showing bliss as taught to pilots, blend, low silhouette, irregular shape, small, secluded. So bliss is clearly um, an acronym for pilots. It's advice for pilots for how to fly in a stealthy way. 
But whenever she hears the word bliss, she thinks about her love life. Look at lines 13 and 14. You know, bliss is how it was in this very room when I raised my body to his mouth, when he even balanced me in the air. So this word bliss has two very different connotations. It can have the militaristic connotations, which we're given directly in lines 10 and 11, or it can have the connotations of joy, a blissful experience, a joyful experience. And here the narrator combines these images of war with these images of love. The two get blurred together and it's really difficult to tell the difference between where the war imagery ends and the love imagery starts. And I suppose that is a commentary on the fact that when we're fed this media diet full of violent imagery, it's going to have a negative impact on us as people. And it might shape the way that we view love. And that's one of the things which Shapcott is exploring in this poem. So let's look at another example of that. We see the dual connotations of the word bliss appear again in the second to last stanza. Bliss, the pilots say, is for evasion and escape. What's love in all this debris? Just one person pounding another into dust into dust. I do not know the word for it yet. So there are two very different ways we can interpret this stanza. One interpretation is this is just about pilots using the acronym BLISS to evade and escape the enemy and they uh, drop their bombs and they pound other people, other armies into dust, into dust. The other way you can interpret this stanza is as a commentary on love in a world fueled by war. Bliss is for evasion and escape. If we interpret bliss here, not as the military acronym, but as a synonym for the word joy, joy is for evasion and escape, is Shapcott suggesting here that in a world filled with violence and hate, people pursue bliss and joy to forget how awful work the world can be? What's love in all this debris, she asks. Debris is a word which describes what's left over after an explosion, the wreckage, the hurt, the pain, the mess. And Shapka asks, does it make sense to love in a world filled with so much violence and hate? It's almost implied that the narrator pursues love just to evade and escape the horrible images of war which fill up our TV screens. There is a really frustrated tone to the rhetorical question in line 30. And I would argue that this rhetorical question with its frustrated tone implies that it's really difficult to make sense of love in a world where there is so much violence. The next line, line 31, is really problematic. As I've said, line 31 could be interpreted as a description of pilots dropping bombs onto other people, killing them, pounding them into dust, into dust. However, because line 31 immediately follows this rhetorical question about love and asking if love makes sense in a world filled with violence, we could view line 31 in a very different way. We could view line 31 as a description of sex. Is love in this world filled with war and violence, just one person pounding another into dust. If so, that's really problematic because the verb pounding is a really violent verb, which implies damage, which implies uh, pain. Perhaps Shapcott is implying that if you are someone who pursues sex just as a way to evade and escape the horrors of war, if that's your only reason for pursuing sex, then it's going to have the effect of hurting the other person. 
It's just one person pounding another into dust. Sex where one person just wants to uh, have pleasure and nothing else is arguably very, very different from two people who just want to be together and to love each other. And so here, Shapcott is raising the question of whether love can always be treated in the right way, in a really healthy way, in a world filled with this much war and violence. Finally, I'd like to consider how war affects people's identity and how war has affected the identity of the narrator of this poem. Is the narrator of this poem like the narrator in Seamus Heaney's Punishment, someone who's constantly wondering if they did the right or wrong thing? Or is the narrator of this poem like the narrator of There's a Certain Slant of Light, someone who's wrestling with thoughts about death? Well, I would argue that war has certainly had a profound impact on the identity of our narrator, and she feels very confused as a result. And this is where I think we should look at the use of phrases from the 1960s phrase book, which appear throughout this poem. We see lots of these in the final stanza. Where is the British consulate? Please explain. What does it mean? What must I do? Where can I find? What have I done? I have done nothing. Let me pass, please. I am an English woman. The first thing that's worth considering is why might someone use phrases from a phrase book in the first place? It's because they don't have the words they need to describe the situation that they're in. They might not have the language or the words necessary to describe what's going on. Therefore, the fact that the narrator of this poem uses more and more phrases from a phrase book throughout this poem implies that as she goes through this poem, as she thinks more and more about the war, her, in, her ability to understand what's going on gets worse and worse. Her ability to use words to describe the war is getting less and less. She needs to rely on these phrases from a phrase book more and more. And the fact that we end the poem with a stanza which is just full of phrases from a phrase book implies that by the end of this poem, our narrator is utterly confused. War has had such a negative impact on her identity, she doesn't have the words to explain her experience of the world. And so it's had a really negative impact on her. Furthermore, in this particular stanza, the combination of the short questions, the short statements, it creates a very chaotic and overwhelming feeling. There's a very overwhelmed tone to this stanza, and that tone mirrors how the narrator feels because of the pervasive impact of war. War has made the narrator feel very confused. It's left her with a real personal struggle, and she doesn't have the words to describe what's going on. Furthermore, the use of phrases from a phrase book reveal that sometimes the narrator herself feels like a victim of war, in the same way perhaps that Dickinson feels a victim of her negative thoughts about death. In the middle of the poem, it says, there is another bag there. I cannot open my case. Look out, the lock is broken. These sound like phrases from a phrase book, but they also sound like someone who is struggling who has had to grab their bags and run quickly in a hurry, perhaps a refugee or a victim of war. The fact that the narrator of this poem uses phrases such as this, which imply that she feels like a victim of war, could reflect that very fact. The narrator feels like a victim of war because the media diet she is being fed has corrupted her sense of personal identity so much. Finally, we even see that wars had such a profoundly negative impact on our narrator, but it's not just affecting her identity, it's even affecting her memory. In the middle of the poem it says, I'm expecting a gentleman, a young gentleman, two gentlemen, some gentlemen, please send him, them, up at once. This phrase reads like the sort of thing you might read in a phrase book, where they give you multiple options for what to say depending on the context. If you're talking to one person, you say, I'm expecting a gentleman. If you're expecting more than one person, you might say, I'm expecting two gentlemen. So this very much sounds like something you would get in a phrase book. But it also implies that she is describing a possible romantic encounter. She was expecting a gentleman to turn up. 
Or was it two gentlemen? Or was it more than two gentlemen? Please send him them up at once. This confusing sentence with a fragmented sentence structure represents and mirrors her fragmented state of mind. War has such a profound impact on our, on our narrator that her memory itself appears fragmented. And that is in turn mirrored by the fragmented structure of the entire poem. So I think it's fair to say that war has had a profoundly negative impact on the identity of our narrator. And that might be a useful point of comparison of other poems which explore the identities of their characters. So this has been my analysis of Joe Shapcott's poem, Phrasebook. I hope you found it useful. I have to say, I feel like I've barely begun to scratch the surface of this poem. There's so much more which could be said about it. And I should also stress that my interpretation is not the only interpretation of this poem. This is just my reaction and my analysis of some of her key ideas in this poem. I would strongly recommend you spend some time looking at this poem, annotating yourself, finding your own interpretation of key quotes and key ideas, and making sure you find good evidence to write about them in your exam. If you found this useful, please do click those like and subscribe buttons. I have a number of other videos about the poems in the Towards a World Unknown Poetry Anthology. If you're studying for your GCC exams, I wish you the best of luck. And until next time, cheerio.